Welcome. Um, I'm both delighted and truly excited by the opportunity to introduce you to tonight's lecturer, Catherine Ingraham. Um, in the just over two decades since she made her first forays into the field of architecture, she has become one of the most welcome and productive in interlocutors our field has yet known. Though trained professionally elsewhere in the university, she has, in a sense, come home to architecture, but as an interloper, an intruder or trespasser, if you will, producing a most singular and incendiary opportunity. For in her compelling body of work, she has made the question of precisely how at home in architecture we humans actually are the topic of serious reflection and wild, provocative speculation. Her achievements to date are many and varied. She holds a PhD in comparative literature from Johns Hopkins University and has published and taught extensively. From 1991 to 1998, she was an editor of the journal Assemblage, a critical journal of architecture and design culture. She is the editor of the anthology Restructuring Architectural Theory from 1988, as well as the author of two books, The Burdens of Linearity, Architecture and the Burdens of Linearity from 1998, and Architecture, Animal, Human, The Asymmetrical Condition from 2006. She currently has two book projects in the works, forthcoming, from which I think we'll be hearing a little tonight. They are entitled Pursuit of Property and Biomodernity. Between 1998 and 2005, she was chair of the graduate program at Pratt Institute School of Architecture, where she currently teaches. She has taught at the schools of architecture of the University of Illinois in Chicago, Iowa State, Princeton, Columbia, and Harvard. In addition, she has taught at the Art Institute of Chicago, the University of Washington in Seattle, and her undergraduate alma mater, St. John's College. She has been a research fellow at the Chicago Institute for Architecture and Urbanism, and a visiting scholar at the Canadian Center for Architecture in Montreal, as well as the recipient of grants from the NEA, NISCA, and numerous McDowell Colony residences. Finally, working in collaboration with Lori Hawkinson of Smith Miller Hawkinson Architects, their collaboration placed first in a 2001 design competition for the Museum of Women to be located in Battery Park City in Lower Manhattan. In preparing this introduction, I deliberated for some time on how precisely to describe Catherine's work for an audience who might, not, who might be unfamiliar with it. Since her days as a student of Jacques Derrida during the late 1970s, when he first began regularly teaching in America, Catherine, like a prospector, has charted the rich vein in deconstructive thinking available in architecture. In the process, she has become perhaps the supplest and most surprising thinker in contemporary architectural discourse. And it can safely be said that her influence now reaches far and wide. Long interested in questions of how architects and others recognize and establish propriety, questions of law's relationship to space, architecture's relationship to law, etc. Within architectural thinking, her writings have circuitously cycled through Shakespeare's King Lear, the paths of donkeys, the symbiosis of trading floors and slaughterhouses, migrancy and drifting, monstrosity and the recent developments in computer animation, Claude Levi-Strauss's structural anthropology in relationship to Le Corbusier's urbanism, biomimicry, and the problem of the accurate representation of birds in flight, to name only some of the places her attention, her attentions have landed. She has done so, thankfully, both properly and impetuously. By impetuously, of course, I mean not the primary dictionary definition. That is, quote, characterized by undue haste and lack of thought and deliberation. On the contrary. Instead, I'm invoking the infrequently employed secondary meaning, quote, marked by violent force, unquote. This is, of course, a reference to her teacher Derrida's example of attending to the often overlooked force of violence at work in language, foundational thinking, and the very architecture of thought, speech, and writing. Throughout her various astute intellectual forays, connecting and reconnecting the myriad points of interest and investment she has plumbed, Catherine has fashioned an ever-moving body of work, one that magnanimously juxtaposes architects' concern with biopolitics, the complexities entailed by simultaneously being alive and being governable, with the emerging dynamic of the post-human, still largely underexplored, territory for architectural attentions. It is likely in no small part due to Catherine's labors that this horizon will not remain unexamined. That is, it will not remain a frontier for much longer. Ultimately, what I find most admirable about Catherine's work 
to borrow a phrase she herself has applied to the human body and its multifaceted and fascinating encounters with architecture is its, quote, complex moving equipoise. So please join me in welcoming Catherine Ingraham. <laughs> I have to, uh, is this, uh, is it working? Can you hear me in the back or is it, no, yes? It's okay? Okay, it doesn't sound okay up here. Sounds like I'm talking to, just to hear, to the front row. But as long as you can hear, that's good. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Brendan, wow. That's like awesome, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, writing, is such a bitch. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it, it's just, it's like architecture. I mean, it's like doing a building where everything snarls around, you know, and it's like suddenly you've got, you know, all these walls in the wrong place and you have to just, oh, the labor. It's unbelievable. Uh, and yet, with luck, with luck, with any luck at all, you get a kind of coherent result for about five seconds. Uh, and that's all it is. It's about five second coherence is what we're dealing with in most cases with uh, not just with ideas in the realm of ideas, but with, uh, with our, you know, with our, s even though constructions stay in place for long periods of time, they, you know, they go in and out of sort of coherent modes. Uh, this pursuit of property title is the title of the book I'm working on, as, as Brendan said. And it's, uh, it's really um, just incredible material. I have the quote from Gabriel Marquez because it truly is uh, just one of the most staggering things I've ever looked at, this question of property. It's not, you know, there's the real estate question which everybody is sort of has their, has their foot in or not or, uh, or is interested in or not, but the, but the property question which engages with so many aspects of, um, uh, human behavior and, and human life and uh, architectural uh, work is, uh, is it's very complex and it's, uh, and it's very, very interesting. So I'm giving you a little piece of it today. I'm going to try and uh, I've tried to not get too digressive into the subject matter that is uh, uh, concerning me now. A lot of it is about American architecture, in particular the book, and I'm not talking about that much today. And um, a lot of it is about um, Thomas Jefferson and surveying, but I'm not talking about that today particularly either. The surveying of the, of the are these yours? <laughs> so, in most contemporary cultures, it's an indisputable fact that architecture, if it is to be built, must be married to a property system. Like most marriages, this union involves laws and rights, family histories, differences in character that in the best cases set the stage for mutual affinity between partners. Such an alliance is never devoid of conflict, of course, but solutions to most of these conflicts are prefigured in the terms of the union. The transformation of architectural work into a commodity, which we are familiar, that's almost a familiar idea for us, uh, into a commodity in a system of capital uh, such as Karl Marx articulated in his massive work, Capital, is certainly part of the story, but it's not the whole story. And I feel that we now have to go, in a certain sense, into different places with this problem of property than Marx, uh, than Marx went. The dynamic forces that Marx discovered in Capital, the forces of labor and money and value and nature, we now grasp almost intuitively in uh, what I'd call a kind of post-Marxist era. And these are always at work in property systems and also, of course, in architectural systems. In the events that followed 9-11 and in our current recession, uh, we have uh, a 21st century benchmark of a sort for what it might mean if capital and the processes, uh, processes that gathered around or aggregated around capital slowed down or stopped moving. Uh, after 9-11, there was a year of no shopping, in a sense. It's a tricky and weird truth that capital has to be on the road. 
it's both, uh, that movement is both its productive engine and its power and also its terrible and destructive mandate. And we've not yet formulated an effective theory of productive cultural homeostasis or a more balanced or less uh, forward moving, um, more circular perhaps, um, idea uh, of ourselves in the world, which is what perhaps we're imagining sustainability to consist of. We've not yet conceived of an economic system, for example, that does not require incessant expansion in order to survive, as in our current pyramid schemes. In fact, the principle of expansion is the central principle of property. Property and capital follow almost biological principles of fecundity in animals, in which increase or extinction are the only options. The spread of us, and in fact, there is in Marx a fascinating relationship between money and metabolic systems that is well worth looking at. The spread of a species across a territory knocking out the competing species is sign of success. Animals, however, and interestingly for different reasons, do not have property. Property wants to expand, but it also kept many cultures, such as Britain and China, stabilized for centuries by fixing the availability of wealth to a limited number of people who held also all the power. The Tea Party uh, candidates at this delicate moment in American history are citing early documents by the founding fathers of the United States to justify what are essentially libertarian, highly idiosyncratic, and dangerously naive theories of private property. And yet, what they're saying is what some of those discussions around the uh, Constitution of the United States uh, uh, were saying and still say, which is that private property is the guarantee of individual liberty. Fascinating as theories of capital, property, and biology, metabolic generational processes are, what I am exploring here by looking at the relationship between architecture and property is in particular how architectural value in the midst of property gets produced and what the consequences of that are, environmental, political, aesthetic, ideological, and uh, theoretical in that post-humanist sense that uh, Brendan mentioned. Architectural work clearly gains a large part of its value. Um, I just want to go blank here for a minute. Uh, a, large part of its a large part of its value from the property system within which it rests, capitalist or otherwise, and contributes value to that system also. Architecture typically requires more building rather than less, and more building increases property value. It's uh, just that simple. Skyscrapers are an excellent example of how a relatively small plot of land can be massively inflated with value by erecting multiple stories into the air. Skyscrapers were a technological breakthrough, of course, invention of the elevator, the bundling of steel. They were also an architectural breakthrough the legendary Chicago Tribune competition began our century-long thinking, rethinking of architecture at massively different scales than had been the case before. And it is also property breakthrough. Skyscrapers are the most valuable properties in the world. However, speaking conceptually, architecture does not give itself up fully to property, even in the case of the skyscraper. There is what I'm calling a reserve of architectural value some aspect of the design process and its results remain detachable from the building and both precede and exceed the building, the construction of the building. This is the part that Ken Frampton has called the public part of architecture. I'm not sure I agree with him yet about whether it is all public. Uh, it's the part that belongs in some sense to the public in, in Frampton's view, regardless of who owns the building. The notion of a public with respect to architecture has, of course, an interesting history. Uh, we know its outlines from Roman and Greek examples of public spaces and structures in cities that arose in response to theories of human society and governance. In our culture, the only part of the legal system that recognizes this reserve of architecture is historic preservation, which is founded on the idea and the public dimension of architecture founded on the idea that you can take an architectural building out of circulation and preserve it on behalf of the common good. But of course, then you take it out of circulation. 
It's also interesting that when someone owns a building designed by an architect, they do not feel uh, they do not feel that they have the right, typically, to dismantle the architectural aspects of the building. There are a few exceptions. Richard Meyer's complex of buildings, which were called the Bronx Development Center on the bottom, uh, was on the outskirts of New York, was peeled of its modernist aluminum skin and reclad in the above picture as the Hutchinson Metro Center. My point is that the act was shocking and the news coverage was shocked by the audacity of a um, developer to reclad a modern icon. Uh, and the act seemed to violate some unwritten law regarding architectural buildings. It's also not incidental that people owning architect, uh, uh, houses designed by architects uh, uh, often turn into curators of that architecture. They don't just live in the house, they also curate the house. In the interest of time, I will only uh, talk about a few things with respect to this complex, what I call nexus between architecture and property. Nexus is taken from eminent domain uh, law, which uh, suggests that there has to be a compensation between uh, the land that you take, for the owner of the land that you take in eminent do domain cases, there has to be a compensation to the owner, and finding the just compensation is the discovery of the nexus. So in a sense, the idea of nexus contains with it a compensatory, a kind of a compensatory mode between architecture and property where they're trying to supplement each other. Property itself is an enormous subject. Every culture on earth has a system of property, uh, whether it's a belief in common property, private property, or some other mixture. Possession or possessiveness per se is not adequate, however, to define the category of property. It's also necessary to have a system of enforcement, law, legal system, juridical system, as well as customs or some other mode of establishing and maintaining property boundaries. Contemporary legal theorists and political philosophers define real property, that is land, which is different than personal property, which is like this, uh, you know, my, my clothes, or, uh, or uh, intellectual property, which are ideas, Land, which is a real property, is defined as a relation between people with regard to things. And this requires custom and or human law to back it up. It's important to emphasize that property is not a thing. It's a relation and a bundle of rights, citizenship and legal rights among them. The legal theorist C.B. McPherson writes that property arises when a society makes a distinction between property and mere physical possession. To have property, he says, is to have a right in the sense of an enforceable claim to some use or benefit of something, whether it is a right to share in some common resource or an individual right in some particular things. What distinguishes property from mere possession, he continues, is that property is a claim that uh, will be enforced by society or the state, by custom, by convention, or by law. Thus, property is necessarily intertwined always with histories of law and justice, the establishment of common interests in societies, formations of governments, theories of individual and state identity, the history of cities, and the sovereignty of nations. I am going to uh, go to this first slide, and there's the Palladio Capra Rotunda is on the left with the agricultural fields in front of it, the definition, the cap of the Villa Rotunda was a uh, speculative property. It was also a, a weekend property. Uh, it was like a country house, and the land was leased out for agricultural purposes. The interesting thing is that we tend to look at the Villa Rotunda from the point of view of its architectural virtuosity, which it has a tremendous amount of, uh, rather than, than from this perspective, we usually look at it from the perspective, in a sense, from standing within the porch and looking out, which is how Colin Rowe describes the Villa Rotunda. You're inside the porch on all four sides, and you look out onto your property, and you grasp your, the extent of the property as the landowner. And we rarely look back at the building as somehow embedded in a, in a property system, particularly a property system that is now agricultural. Um, David Rui has been calling this the technological agricultural villa. 
On the right upper is the Blur Building and on the, by Dillers Gepidio, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. These are the two most overexposed projects of, in architecture, I think, at this time. Or maybe it was two years ago, they were the most overexposed projects. They're already dated, but they're uh, the endless, endlessly gorgeous photographs of all of them. And on the bottom is the Thurm Balls by Peter Zumther, who won the Pritzker Prize, 2009, I think. Uh, and these are going to be the projects I'm going to end with. And I'm just going to kind of mark as we go along uh, different things about them that I'm trying to read in property terms, in the way I'm trying, I would read the Villa Rotunda through its agricultural domain. Now, we think we know what that means. We think it means uh, that uh, we just go up and look up the land value, and we go and we check out you know, what kind of crops were grown and what they sold for, and then we give it a kind of, we follow the money, in other words, we give it an economic value and then we know what the property question is. But I'm suggesting that the property question actually has a, a more, uh, be precisely because of the fact that property is not a thing, but a relation that it infects the architecture in a, in a more profound way. It's not just a value upon which the architecture sits. All architecture is property. Uh, a former student of mine, Aaron White, has, has said, but not all property is architecture. In other words, systems of property are inescapably at work in the discipline and practice of architecture, yet property itself refers to a huge variety of things. How, one might ask, does architecture accede to the part of itself that belongs to these property forces? For fear of commodification, which we understand as a cynical reduction of architecture to an object that is shaped by the expediencies of money, media, and fashion, we have not acceded openly to our architectural inscription and property system. And yet architecture is the discipline and practice that's used to being suspended between things. I mean, it's used to being suspended between conceptual design work and its realization. What else is architecture except for the design of what is to be built? Uh, uh, and so, and the, uh, we're used to contending with ideals and contingencies, the material realization of an idea. And my question is what this means in property terms. An architectural idea is theoretically protected by intellectual property law, whereas an architectural building is protected by real property law. The destiny of architectural ideas is ideally, except in rare cases, the construction of these ideas in a real property system as a building or some kind of construction. This, I just read Mark Jarzombek's little blurb in the thing that MIT just put out called the Little Thesis, and he said that we're suspended between the image and the, and the building. Often we're just saying we're suspended between architecture and the building. This creates a unique property condition in which architecture as property is based, is based in a real property system in which the architectural part is without any ownership stake. What is, owned in what is owned in architecture are concepts, not objects, and those concepts are, for the most part, indefensible in a court of law. It's almost impossible to define where an architectural idea resides in a building, and most litigation around intellectual property laws that are supposed to protect architectural ideas do not uh, succeed in uh, settlement on the behalf of the architect, on behalf of the architect. Among other things, there's also a lack of evidence for architecture's conceptual work. The sketches and diagrams and working drawings we draft cannot be easily assembled into something that could be protected legally. So in some sense, an architecture property nexus is extra legal. It's outside a legal system. To state this another way, it is impossible to design what we call architecture without considering conditions of ownership, occupation, use, infrastructure, in short, architecture as property, even if a project is never to be actualized. By contrast, sculpture, for example, has few if any of these burdens of constructing space materials for the conduct of life, and the sculptor owns the sculpture until he or she sells it. Architecture and the buildings they design are thus forced into a paradox and a predicament designing within the constraints and realities of property systems without the legal protection of ownership. Architecture property, then, is a new term, unique to our profession, and without any legal or political history 
which is perhaps why we really haven't understood its power. It is notable in this regard that typically the contract we sign, the contracts we sign as architects uh, with a client, uh, never uses the word design, although it was the promise of some act of design that won the project in the first place. The design of the project is contractually summarized under something called architectural services, which means management of contractors and material assemblies. The design of the project, so central to the architect's work, nevertheless unfolds throughout the construction of the project <clears throat> as an almost secretive, impossible to locate, supplemental aspect of the project. Those large steel prows of Tom Main's uh, buildings, for example, that sell his architecture are nevertheless in constant threat, under constant threat of being lost or, trun uh, lost or truncated because the logic of construction economies uh, is to shave off every piece of apparently useless excess, which of course implicates first and foremost the so-called extraneousness of architectural features, which after all have no legal defender. It is, if, <clears throat> it, it is as if architecture gets thrown to the outer edges of the construction process in legal terms. The contract per se does not prevent what I'm calling con, uh, con, a construction logic from working at every level. And there is consequently a kind of crisis in achieving, every time a building's built, there's a kind of crisis in achieving architectural work in the midst of its necessary realization. The theoretical implications of this are for me quite stunning. In real property law, there's no provision, in other words, for what I would call real intellectual property law. These two worlds are in fact kept apart. <clears throat> Current debate on virtual property on the internet is currently running headlong into this issue from a different uh, side of the coin. These uh, virtual uh, property debates uh, point out, in the case of the game Second Life for example, that virtual property can behave economically precisely like real property precisely because property is about relations, not things. And relations are, in fact, all virtual in some aspect, to some, in some part of themselves. But the legal system strives, because it is a legal system, to codify these relations in ways that make empirical distinctions between real property, personal property, virtual property, intellectual property. And as a side note to what this What's happening with this? Uh, because I've been looking at early, I've been looking at the Constitution of the United States and the, what happened to property in that Constitution, the tripartite inalienable rights guaranteed to the people of the United States were uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Uh, but at happiness there is replacing an earlier formulation of, that everybody else used for, cent, for a couple hundred years which was life, liberty, and property. And so you could say property somehow gets buried into that happiness, and what that means is uh, quite interesting. Uh, <clears throat> but because I'm looking at that period, there's a particular question of the problem of the ownership of slaves, and totally, in a sense, inappropriate ownership of people as real property. They are not being owned as things. They're not being owned as um, the way I own a suit of clothing. They're being owned the way you own land and that you dispose and you sell them the way you sell land. And uh, the strangeness of including a, a human body in the uh, domain of real property where real property in a sense has to climb up on the back of something that is um, not inert, not alienable, not able to be sold, so difficult to sell because of the problematic, and not just from the outside where we say, good God, you can't sell human people, but human beings, but it's from the inside, the body does not accede to being sold because the body is not part of a property system. The body is part of a biological system, which is entirely different logic. So it was, it's inter I, I'm thinking of that possibly as a way of thinking about the, how certain kinds of mistakes in property history, major mistakes, I mean slavery was a disaster all around, that certain mistakes in property history point out certain fallacies in uh, the legal, uh, legal systems 
a, attempt to hold real property as separate from virtual property, to hold real property as separate from uh, the system of relations that it is. Uh, architectural, our architectural property, this kind of nexus I'm talking about, is um, a, a nexus, therefore, of intellectual and real property, conceptual work, its realization in a real world sense, and a paradox and predicament of ownership around and through which there is no clear legal path or pattern of rights. Let me return just briefly to the um, questions of property proper in order to help flesh out a little bit this nexus that I'm talking about. McPherson makes the point that property takes mere possession to the next level, but property is an enforceable possession. He ties property thus to society and the state and restates the necessary though much debated philosophical evolution from John Locke uh, in the 17th century writing on property, where famously John Locke claims, and this is the Tea Party people are also uh, resurrecting this um, from the past, claims that possession is a natural right based on our right to own, to our own uh, preservation. Here's what Locke writes in the second treatise. Being human beings, being once born, have a right to their preservation, their own preservation, and consequently to meat and drink, to food, and such other things as nature affords for their subsistence, or for their revelation, which gives us an account of those grants God made of the world to Adam and to Noah and his sons. It's very clear that God has given the earth to the children of men, given it to mankind in common. Locke argues from these first principles that private property naturally arises from common property because every man, quote, has a property in his own person and the labor of his body and the work of his hands are properly his. Whatever man takes from nature becomes his own property through the labor of taking and mixing labor, his labor, into nature. Nourishment by acorns that humans picked up from under an oak tree and appropriated, had become appropriated to himself. In other words, taken on as property for his own nourishment and self-preservation. This starts at the moment of picking up the acorn. Human labor adds something more to nature in Locke's theory. In, uh, and, and Locke names this uh, additional thing that human labor adds to nature as the private right to possession and ultimately private property. Locke's state of nature, of course, never exists in any pristine or innocent sense. There's never a moment before which, you know, we don't, the world is not just there for the taking and then we suddenly open the door to the world and go out and take things. Uh, nor, in a theoretical sense, could this state of nature have lasted for more than a couple seconds. There are all too soon too many acorns, not enough people, not enough acorns, too many people, surplus and scarcity. The commons from which the acorns are initially taken become diminished as the acorns are used up by everybody's labor to appropriate things to their own needs. So we, we're thinking in rationally about our own self-interest in order to feed our families and ourselves, and we act independently. And if that's the case, that's the logical case of self-preservation, we will eventually deplete shared limited resources even when it's clear that it's not in anybody's long-term interest to do so. And this is called The Tragedy of the Commons by Garrett, that Garrett Hardin kind of theorized in 1968. But it's the problem with sustainability because uh, sustainability suggests that you would share in common resources and at the same time pursue self-preservation. And there's a contradiction there. Even when surplus occurs, it's rarely the case that things taken into private possession are returned to the commons, and if they are, they're returned as a gift, and the gift inaugurates an entirely different economy. As anthropologists have said for many years, there's no such thing as a free gift. To digress for a few more minutes before getting back in a way into the architectural groove, uh, there's something about what I mentioned at the beginning that has to do with the necessary expansion of property. In the case of Locke's natural scene of property, need expands exponentially because need is never separate from desire, which is capable of imagining an infinite number of things 
that it needs and wants. The main point to be uh, uh, seen here is that property is not natural. However, and, 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 and yet we tend to naturalize it as if it has always existed rather than seen it in either historical or theoretical terms. Property is also, again restating McPherson, not, it's not only not itself a thing, but it's also not in things. Property is not in the acorn you harvest, nor the land you plow. The acorn and land belong to ecological, and biological, agricultural systems to which property refers only indirectly. Um, property is a relation between people, again, in relation to the land and the acorn. And it bounds that land and, and, and those acorns with what one could call calculable parameters. How much is there? Who owns it? What's its value? It's interesting, however, that we have naturalized the concept of property so completely that it appears natural as if it arose from natural tendencies. Architecture's role in all this uh, 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 is uh, an, an interesting one, and it kind of centers a little bit because architecture takes for granted its um, place in the property scheme, and it also takes for granted its uh, uh, the the power of ownership to uh, um, bring architecture into realization. That it made me wonder. Uh, and has made a number of people wonder, uh, not just me, it's a long-standing kind of theoretical investigation about what does it mean to own something. I mean, take our houses, or actually you shouldn't take my house because I'm just, I, I'm entangled like everybody in this like special version of hell that is New York real estate. But let's take your house here in Syracuse. <laughs> the, New York is crazy. Uh, the house you buy is mortgaged to the bank uh, for most of the time you live in that structure. The bank, in order to finance your house, uses the money owned by depositors, which in turn are guaranteed by insurance companies and the federal government, which in turn is, uh, you know, the federal government is financed by taxpayers. The infrastructures that support the house, without which you could not live in the house, electricity, gas, sewers, water, are owned in part by utility companies, maybe private or public entities. There are many things, furthermore, that you cannot do in or with your house. There are covenants that control aesthetic modifications, zoning regulations, neighborhood, community rec uh, restrictions, and policies. Your house, as an object you own, exists inside this complex of secondary and tertiary ownership rights that have the power to shut the house down or alter its character completely. At the moment of taking out a second mortgage, for example, which is a legal way of leveraging the time, labor, and money invested in your property on behalf of uh, entropic or ritualistic processes like repairs to the house, for example, or college or health care costs. Your house may appear to belong to you, to be yours to borrow against as a piece of collateral, but a second mortgage is a remortgaging of the future of your ownership. Everything about ownership is tied to time, in fact a new shift of the house away from your ownership. One way to say this would be to say that life and ownership depend on each other but operate according to different logics. William Blackstone said something to the effect that the land itself is one thing and the estate in land is another thing. The difficulty of locating property in nature, culture, and cultural history, the dependence of ownership on ownership relations, and so forth, like law and government suggest that property is a fairly tricky place in which to secure any principles, much less architectural principles. The complex labor of architecture, again that labor of conceptualizing, it's conceptualizing life and space in relation to the contingencies of a material world, brings it into relation to property. This is also the moment, as I said, when architecture becomes uh, 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 both sublimated in the, into the building and left without an ownership stake, ownership stake. It's no accident that we feel compelled to revisit our architectural work again and again, befriending the client or occupant, admonishing them for not using the space appropriately, lamenting, in a sense, the loss of a building that we have designed and built. That building, that building belongs to us, the architect, in some way that is never verified by a legal or property status, by its legal or property status. We can now say that when architecture enters a scene of property, certain things unfold. First, architecture brings what Blackstone calls the thing itself to the property transaction. 
which serves a legal collection of rights, right to possession, right to own, right to property, surrounding owner, that surround ownership. Second, architecture also brings a surplus value, an idea of a supplemental structure, the symbolic work of architectural design into the idea of property. The architect further, in negotiating a contract with a client, must split the architectural project in legal terms into, on the one hand, the design and intellectual property part, the part that he or she does own, and uh, the prop real property part, which he or she does not own. In this process, the architect also works to preserve the design in the face of the erosive forces of actualization, material technology, construction, site control, infrastructural uh, vicissitudes, and so forth. In a minute, I'm going to get closer into some of these projects in order to try and test some of this in a, in a more real world context. Uh, but I want to say first that the, the most fascinating sort of case study for property is architectural modernism. Modernism made excellent use of property's talents, one of which is to define a bounded area by means of a social and legal relation. Uh, modernism's claim for architecture is an autonomous discipline, I'm sure you're familiar with this, depended on its material and conceptual grasping of a site by means of the plinth. Architecture's desired autonomy was forcibly symbolized by this plinth, a flat polygon of space placed on top of a site that takes architectural possession of that site by asserting its formal independence from what lies around and beneath it. The figure of the plinth is important particularly for its calculable character, its geometry, <coughs> it's measurable, and for its polemical detachment, even if only imputed from an ecological ground, whose infrastructural and property status is already anticipated by all the material layers placed over it. The plinth, uh, in other words, you could say that what stands in the way of sustainable architecture is property. The plinth restates property in architectural terms. The ecological ground, which is not a plane but a network of different systems that exist at a range of scales and intensities, is radically different from the ground of property. It is difficult for architecture to apprehend the scale and the non-geometric and heterogeneous character of an ecological system, even now when it seems to most want to apprehend it. The Barcelona Pavilion, Farnsworth House, expressed the plinth's most idealized expression although the plinth took many forms, including the massive public uh, spaces of modernist federal buildings um, and, uh, and the pedestals of modernist skyscrapers. Uh, other plinth-like systems like surveying uh, the dimensions of the Jeffersonian grid in the United States were not strictly architectural, but they are also uh, property systems in the sense that they serve as a descriptive diagram for our understanding of the physical world, and that's what we refer to when we use GPS or topog maps or maps of vegetation for USGS maps of vegetation, geologic maps. Those maps are all formed from the surveys and uh, the information on them was discovered through surveying, which is a way of dimensionalizing the landscape into uh, what, uh, to, to the grid such that you know what can be bought and sold ultimately. So the Seagram building and the, uh, again, the pedestal of the Blur building on the upper right. And I, 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 I don't have a, I don't have a, even though the Therm Vols is a modernist building in, in, in essence, I don't think, I mean, I think, I, I, I don't know if it's a plinth building or not, but it's a, it's a, a deeply property structure. Um, there's, it's interesting that um, we uh, believe that property can be owned, actually. It's interesting that we can believe we can own something in our name. And what allows us to owe something in our name is, in a certain sense, a throwback to Locke's belief that our name is uh, somehow, our self-identity is caught up in the problem of property. Uh, certainly the same psychophysiological mechanisms that shape our self-identity 
uh, are, um, and, uh, are, are the same mechanisms that shape property. And that's why you would talk, if you really were talking about property, you would talk about the proper name as well. And you would talk about propriety, which I did earlier in an earlier book. But it, um, these things are intimately connected. But I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, I'm, I'm because I want to sort of continue with this um, architecture property nexus and its legality and extra legality, and I want to say that that nexus forms a particular kind of uh, apparatus. Uh, both law and architecture were included on a, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this book that's come out recently called What is an Apparatus by Giorgio Agamben, but uh, he goes, he's going back to Foucault and, and, and resurrecting Foucault's theory of the apparatus. It's incredibly interesting architecturally because it suggests that, it's, it suggests how you get a mechanism to intersect with political uh, how mechanisms intersect with political um, projects. Uh, Foucault's, uh, obviously, the, the, the mechanism that Foucault used most extensively was a panopticon. Uh, this was where he talked, everybody's familiar with a panopticon, and uh, it's uh, the salt works on the left and the blur building on the right, the platform for the blur building. The panopticon was what Foucault called a kind of architectural device for uh, the creation of, for the, for the uh, actually the more, um, I have the uh, uh, actual panoptic diagram which shows that the, you know, the mechanism of the panopticon was the mechanism of uh, surveillance and it was based on modernism's theory of vision which is uh, that visuality is capable of arresting people, in a sense, in a place and holding them there. Um, in the way we have video cameras all over, ubiquitous you video cameras that watch us, and yet we don't really know who's behind the camera, and you don't really know who's in the center of the composition of the panopticon either, but the uh, act of vision itself leads to internalization of surveillance, so we all watch ourselves. Uh, because of the uh, panoptical device. Uh, <clears throat> and that was, that was Foucault's uh, idea of an architectural apparatus. When Agamben kind of resurrects Foucault uh, in this book, What is an Apparatus? He, he says that he felt that this term apparatus was an incredibly important technical term in the strategy of Foucault's thought. And he, he said that, uh, he says that apparatus is a heterogeneous set of elements, he's kind of expanding the field of the apparatus, that includes almost anything, discourses, institutions. Foucault was very interested in the prison, the institution of the prison, of the, the salt factory, the, the school, the hospital. Uh, and so institutions, buildings, laws, police measures, even language. The, that an apparatus is a network established between these elements and that it always has a concrete strategic function and is always located in a power relation. As such, uh, Agamemnon writes, apparatus appears at the intersection of power relations and uh, systems of knowledge. Uh, and uh, this is also what Foucault said. But um, the interesting thing is to then determine whether architecture is an apparatus or how, how it would be. That, you know, there's a long history of trying to figure out how architecture can be political. In a review just a few minutes ago, you know, I heard people talking about how property values had gone up in a particular neighborhood, the people who were living there could no longer afford to live there, and so what were they going to do? How were you going to architecturally intervene in that project in order to uh, solve what is, in effect, a class and political social problem? Um, and we've had, the, we've had many theories of how architecture is related to power, and the apparatus is, was, a, was one of those theories that we were interested in. And so now Agamemnon is kind of updating this. Um, what Agamemnon uh, adds to Foucault's list is um, he changes Foucault's words, architectural forms, such as the panopticon, to buildings. And he doesn't discuss buildings 
uh, although in his scheme, buildings qualifies these legal juridical apparatuses. But their aesthetic or their, the, the dimension, the symbolic dimension I've been talking about vis-a-vis -vis architecture is unfixed, as I say, in their legal identity. Uh, uh, Foucault's widely known example, the Panopticon, which I've already talked about, uh, he subject, subjected a number of institutions to panoptical tests. Um, and uh, the question of vision and visuality is crucial to then what comes out of the really significant thing that comes out of theories of apparatus. The importance of elaborating a notion of apparatus in terms of visuality, in terms of modernism or architectural institutions, uh, I mean, institu into institutions that have used panoptical device, so to speak, um, which are our contemporary institutions, uh, and the transfer of that into surveillance equipment, which now becomes high security equipment of all sorts. The importance of that is what Agamemnon calls the creation of the subject. Now, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the literature on the creation of the subject, but I want to spend a few minutes on it because it's, uh, it's, very, it's very closely tied with what's going on in the architecture property nexus. The importance of elaborating the notion of an apparatus is to remind us of something we already know, that a central feature of modernity beginning in the 18th century which was the same century in which law itself was altered radically to demand that evidence rather than hearsay form the basis of a legal argument, was to convert people and even inanimate things and objects through the mechanism of agency into subjects. The light in the Enlightenment is light shed on people in a new way. The control of people through surveillance, eyewitness accounts at first and later control of people through what Agamemnon names as biomodern politics. Apparatuses, according to Agamemnon, designate that in, that in which and through which one realizes a pure activity of governance devoid of any foundation in biological being. This is the reason why apparatuses have to supply a subject. They have to Im imply a process of subjectification, making of the person who is the person who occupies the institution, say the, um, the school, the student is a subject, the citizen is a subject, the worker is a subject, the, uh, in the sense that they're not whole living beings, they are designated according to their institutional identity and the institution takes them on and requires certain things of them, that the link of the, the living occupant to the structure is through subjecthood. In other words, we behave a certain way as a citizen, we behave a certain way as a student, we behave a certain way as a prisoner. Um, to be a subject, uh, to be a subject in a democratic sovereignty, for example, is to ado adopt the discourse and demeanor of a citizen, which also implies that one can be stripped of citizenship and thrown out of the membership that citizenship implies. To be an architectural subject means to act according to certain proprieties of occupation and ownership, to adhere in some general way to the architectural program, which after all is derived from habits of living. Uh, proprieties, as we know, which are ha where habits of living come from, the kind of agreed upon ways of behaving in space, it, are not laws, they're customs. It is the custom from which laws are made, proprieties. Customs predate law. Architect architecture has itself no power to enforce proprieties other than the surrogate powers given to it by its alliance with property. And you could even say that it's property that has upholded typological uh, uh, systems in architecture. The question of subject formation leads to the historical divide between cultures driven by custom rather than law, and those are typically called kinship cultures. Property is not in just any relation between people with re regard to things. It's also a proprietorial relation in which customs and communication systems have become legalized. There have been, of course, substantial debates in architecture around this notion of the architectural subject. A citizen is a legal subject, but also a body in space. It has legal significance. A citizen, for example, enters a contract by signing his or her own name, and that signature, which is the proper name, 
uh, has evolved into a propriety, a customized signature that then passes into a kind of legal act. The consequences of splitting architectural design off from property then is also a kind of splitting of propriety from property, which is what happens in this architectural property nexus. And it's somewhat emblemized by the electronic signatures that we do no longer require us to be the scene of transfer, like when you sign something on the internet, and also by the need for the architect to sign a contract for architectural services, but to leave without signature the architecture itself. We speak of signature architects, those buildings we know by the name of the architect, and yet those buildings are in a legal sense unsigned. The naming of those buildings is verified by, by what amounts to pre-18th century law, which is hearsay. Agamben in a, uh, has, a, has a theory of signatures where he connects the signature to certain kind of theological origins, as in the beginning was the word, by word alone was the world created. The signature, he writes, is what makes the mute signs of creation, he's talking about on a painting, for example, that makes that sign of creation effective and expressive. And architecture property nexus leave aspects of the building's creation unexpressed, therefore, and ineffectual. There are any number of examples one could look at with respect to this material. And, and this is by way of a kind of conclusion and working, trying to work the material now through a, a um, again, through the Blur building and the Therm Vols building to begin to activate it in those places. Um, and uh, uh, as I said earlier, I've been working on the agricultural, technological agricultural villa and Thomas Jefferson's uh, pulling up and putting down of uh, Monticello and his ultimate bankruptcy. Um, but here I want to take a look at, you know, these contemporary overexposed buildings, the Blur building, by Diller Scafidio and the Therm Vols by Peter Zumther. This is tough I, because I don't, uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll say this at the end. Both of these buildings are in Switzerland, of course, they, um, and both are concerned with water, both are signature buildings, both are accessible to the public, both are based on sensory experience, and both make use of various mechanisms. However, one of them, the uh, Blur building is temporary, essentially without a property stake to begin with, and so therefore not concerned with the question of property. The other one is owned in the typical Swiss manner and uh, meant to endure. These projects do not complete my discussion, but only present by way of conclusion different examples of how we might pose this architectural property question, uh, this architectural property nexus, uh, less in sort of uh, abstract theoretical terms, which I've done with Louis Sullivan's building a little more effectively. This is a relatively new juxtaposition. The Blur building, of course, was built for that, the 2002 International Exposition, Exposition in Switzerland by Diller Scafidio. It, as everyone knows, it takes the, the water from the lake and shoots it through these nozzles and which turned out to be about 31,000 novels, uh, nozzles. It's, it started as 13,000 and then it ended up as 31,000 because they couldn't get the fog to be dense enough. And it forms this large fog bank around a steel platform um, that's situated in the middle of the lake, or well, actually closer to the shore than you think. Um, Misproduction is regulated by this climate data that's collected on board the platform, and so depending on the wind direction and the speed and humidity, the formlessness of the fog takes different forms. Uh, um, it's almost as if Diller Scafidio said, you want blobs? We'll do blobs. We'll show you blobs. Uh, it was uh, in, in, in the same way that they have been able to somehow cut into the that cut into the heart of certain um, architectural movements. Uh, I think the, uh, the project costs about $7.5 million. People visiting the structure walk out on the two long walkways that you can see here, and um, they are, they're given raincoats, and they visit a bar on the platform that's called the Angel Bar that sells international waters. International bottles, you know, bottles of international water, you know, water from all over the world that uh, we have to 
say is in, in itself kind of wild, you know, that you could like bottle water from all over the world. But we buy these bottles all the time and drink them. The Thurm Vols by uh, Peter Zumther, which is uh, in the uh, Swiss, uh, Swiss Alps, uh, associated with several hotels that are 100% communally owned by the village. The Thurm is a spa with hot and cold water pools and other spa amenities made from local stone called Ganis, which is a Valser quartzite, laid in multiple layers for the walls. And you can see here a good example of how striated and kind of uh, multi-layered the walls are. The spa is fed by a geothermal spring from the Bernina mountain range, which is close by. The Rhine River, which also dumps into Lake uh, Neuchâtel, where the Blur Building is, has its headwaters in this part of the Alps. 53% of Switzerland's energy comes from hydroelectric dams and 5% from geothermal power plants. The rest is from nuclear plants. Both projects are engaged to a greater or lesser degree in shaping an idea of who is to occupy and use these structures, like every architectural project. As those ideas are forecast in each building by the architect in most cases, we can attest to a few uh, preliminary subject formations. In both cases, the tourist, uh, who may or may not be a Swiss citizen, maybe a taxpayer, an energy customer. In the case of the Therm, the bather, whom Zumther found to be an archaic idea, which is an archaic idea. The uh, baths at uh, Istanbul and Budapest are lavish palaces of, palaces of bathing. Um, there is a, both projects have a client. In the case of the Blur Building, it was a feder the federation. Switzerland made, and most of the money was uh, European, Union, European Union money. And in the case of the Therm, it was the village community, which uh, 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 was able to finance it with uh, help from uh, Swiss banks. There are also mechanisms. Architecturally, the Blur Building is a spectacle, whereas the Thermval is an anti-spectacle as Zumther calls it. The Blur Building had the mechanism of the no nozzles, the platform, the walkway, and the uh, brain coats. I, I you're probably familiar with the brain coats, which were the raincoats originally were supposed to be wired with information that would allow the wearers to interact with other people walking on the platform. And it was meant to um, be a sort of uh, substrate of uh, the expression of desire of people, the tourists in a sense, as they became attracted to other tourists. In, in the therm, it's the waterworks that regulate the temperature of the water and the effects of the building proper. This all sounds fairly formulaic, and it's again the kind of follow the money uh, strategy, but its point is to push us behind the architectural facades per se. In looking for information on either of these buildings, the amount of uh, websites that mention, I mean, any, any time you put in uh, Swiss property, the Therm Vols comes up. Any time you put in uh, water or any kind of water inquiry whatsoever brings up the Blur Building and, and the Therm Vols. They are so widely dispersed through the, the system of information around Switzerland and around water and around property and around uh, uh, the uh, use of geothermal. I, every time I would enter like geothermal, you know, keywords, I would get the therm vols again and again and again. So they have put up this incredible kind of facade that is um, the building as uh, public relations, which we're very familiar with. But trying to get behind that facade is really kind of this. It requires a certain sort of strategy that. Um, that has to do in a way with just finding incidental information that somehow is packed in behind the facade. It's also interesting that the Blur Building is a kind of rift on the absence of a facade and that the Therm is an all too present, all encompassing, huge facade of stone. It's all facade, really. The property status of each project can be summarized as follows. Uh, the Blur Building skillfully seems to want it both ways and almost have it both ways. It's part of the international exposition, so it's clearly a state project. It's clearly state-sponsored. Um, but it seems to, in the way that Dillard's Graffitio projects are able to somehow grasp uh, something, whether they get the rights for it or not is another question. But they uh, seem to be able to grasp a certain uh, uh, kind of um, dominance for architectural features rather than national purposes.
the Blur building suggests that architecture might be able to become a blob apparatus that's situated between formlessness and the state, producing in the process the blurry contemporary subject, a mystification of the subject, in other words. In other words, a, an advance, maybe, even in subject formation in order to elude the heavy hand of commodification and pursue a kind of architectural happiness. The Blur building seems to suggest an architecture that is pulling free of a property condition in spite of the massive exposure. Uh, first, because of this temporariness, second, through that mystification of the subject who's not only metaphorically blurry, but literally lost in the fog. And third, by creating a blob on a plinth to uh, uh, critique both modernist and contemporary architectural styles. Having said that, however, and, and the therm by contrast is a um, deeply heavy, it's almost heavy in the 18th century sense of like natural history museums. It's trying almost to be like the mountain that it's in. It's using the court quartzite from the mountain site. The quarry is nearby. The geothermal spring is right there, feeding right into it. It, it almost doesn't even have to pay for its materials or its water because it's, uh, because it's so, it just can take from the mountain and be part of the mountain. And yet it was interesting to me that Elizabeth Dillard often speaks of the Blur Building at the level of a natural, at, at the scale of a natural element of the landscape like a mountain. So in a certain sense, both have certain mountain aspirations. Um, having said all this, however, we can only catch a brief glimpse of the utopic state of an architecture that can own itself inside property. Uh, and the idea of an exhibition is itself a kind of temporary, uh, it's an idea of temporariness and exhibition projects typically have more freedom, and exhibitions themselves have become uh, uh, sites of uh, problematic representation of cultural values that uh, sometimes, which are all too heavily connected with uh, 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 cultural uh, uh, biases, and other times are without character of any kind. Um, so. It, it's, so the exhibition character of that actually makes it a kind of unfair fight, let's say, between a building that has to stand and belong to the property system and a building that can be dramatic and spectacular but temporary. So if we uh, had to vote, which is not advised, it's not advised that we vote, but if we had to vote, we would have to say that maybe the Blur building does pull away from property more effectively than the Therm building, but this is not to say that it's liberated. And the theme of liberation is a complete red herring and not, not something I want to pursue, and yet it began to occur to me that because of the mist, the mist itself, which is the formal expression of the building, that's why we look at the building, because the mist is the signature of the building, that that signature travels through across the lake in such a way as to completely render the boundaries that of the ownership of the lake irrelevant. The lake is owned by Switzerland, Germany, and Austria, and all, I'm sure they've marked out, you know, the bound, as if you could bound a body of water, which you can't, but the, the, the evapor evaporated water is somehow symbolizing the impossibility of bounding water, and, and it also is successfully traveling into, um, uh, in, uh, across the boundaries with, with impunity. And you could say, well, it's just, you know, it's just mist, it evaporates, it has no holding power for the symbolic form that we associate with architecture, and yet I think that in, to some degree we buy it as architecture as a kind of, we buy it as a kind of blob architecture. So the, 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 the contrast between the therm balls and the um, blur building is really meant to alert us and this is my kind of final point, only because I want to say why why would why would we what, where does the architecture property nexus come to roost in our current thinking in architecture? Um, and I would and some of the subtleties of the relationships may not be uh, exactly the point. Um, but what is the point is the the sense in which we have um, that the blob building not only is. Ex uh, pulling itself away from property, but we are, in a sense, in our design environments uh, and through digital design, also pulling away from property. And, or 
pulling, and I would say that the minute, that's why when you build the building that is a blur building or a, or a blob building, that you hear this tremendous crash as it falls out of the computer and lands on the site and becomes this kind of awkward, static thing that is not at all what anybody had in mind when they were working it in the computer. So there is a, pro and that's, pro that's property, that's the crash of property. And so you could say, well, there's, in, in our digital environments, which are uh, extremely, uh, 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 you know, without scale 90% of the time and without weight, that, um, that we begin, that we need to begin to ask a certain kind of question about like what would it mean for this uh, digital work to, I mean, what's, what are the consequences for digital work once it goes into a property system? Um, the, uh, the last thing I want to mention is, do, uh, is, are the buildings that, uh, in Dubai, which everybody is also familiar with, highly overexposed, but many of the architects who are building in Dubai, which is an exhibition architecture, but there it's not, it's not, spec, it's not a temporary production, it's a, like <clears throat> giant buildings are being built there, that all of them are heavily plinth, in the sense that none of them touch the ground, or very few of them touch the ground. The reason for that is that um, they're not meant to be occupied as by Arab citizens. They're not meant to be part of that culture. They're meant to be for international business people who are flying out and in and, and driving cars and the cars go under the building and you go up into the building. They're meant as a kind of global plinth building. And, <clears throat> and the property issues associated with those buildings is extraordinary. The property convolutions associated with inserting that kind of building into Arab culture is incredible, incredibly interesting. So I think there is a lot of pertinence to this without, <clears throat> without voting for against, you know, for, for against the blur and the therm. Both are spectacularly beautiful, you know, and the beauty is extraordinary. So that's, that's the end. I think we have a, I think we have a difficult, perplexing conditions here. Okay. <clears throat> oh, what did I have? Oh, I had that UK project, that wild one. You've seen this. Seat pavilion. <coughs> Fiber optic. Actually, this project is ridiculous. <laughs> this is like a hat, really. I mean, but it, it's ridiculous because it it's not, hasn't done anything with the seeds. The seeds are just contained there, and then when they tear it down, they'll all be destroyed. So it's supposed to be a seed bank for, you know, uh, the genetically threatened or, uh, you know, and, it, and so it has all these exotic and hard to rare seeds sort of encapsulated in the end of these fiber optic cables that then make this building. And it's, uh, but it seems ridiculous. It really doesn't care about the seeds, in other words. Anyway, that was just another. Yeah, questions? Uh, thank you very much. Um, and, and thank you for pontificating against this project as well. I think that's quite, quite a, apropos. Um, uh, I have a question regarding this 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 proposition about the the real property of architecture and its ambiguity. Um, in my work, which has looked a lot at the kind of question of retail architecture and the imbrication of retail logics, uh, consumerism, and, and and the built artifact, when as these things become folded into each other more clearly, there's a on one hand a tremendous ambiguity between intellectual property, which is, say, architectural design, and intellectual property, which is intellectual property of the corporation which produces the building, um, to the extent that, so there's an ambiguity, but also a fusion, in that much work done in this vein actually brands the built work. So the, the, any photography of the built work, the built work itself, is actual real and intellectual property simultaneously of the owner, again, not of the architect. So the question of your ambiguity of architectural idea ownership is, is still there. But an architect designing this work doesn't own the right to redistribute the drawings. They don't own the rights to build that project again for somebody else or leverage it. They don't own the building. And so there's, I don't know if you've looked at that work, but I think there's a strange kind of problematic there that you don't quite address, but I'm sure you've conceptualized it somewhere. No, way, I'm glad to know about that. I don't know about that. It, um, so you're, and, and so you're saying that the, um, 
that the problem of uh, of uh, intellect, what it, intellectual property and real property, the confusion between intellectual property and real property is not unique to, or that what I was saying, the problem of the of finding real intellectual property uh, is um, not unique to architecture. It's also a corporate problem. Or it, it's a corporate problem. It's also addressed by single ownership, right? So that, you know, I make a, and I first discovered this, um, I do work on branding and architecture, yeah. but I discovered it very materially in a studio where I saw drawings of a project and photographs of a project, none of which could be shared with me until the owner, British Petroleum, gave the go-ahead. Um, so it had nothing, you know, the ownership of everything, of the photographs of the building, the building, the drawings of the building were all part of the branding strategy of the corporation. Right. And so, you know, kind of writing about this and thinking about it, you discover in a, a much larger variety of projects than you would think. Right. You know. Right. Like perhaps that, right, you know. Right. Who owns the rights to those images? I don't know. I mean, it, it right. seems to problem. Well, it's that true. I mean, I, I run into that a lot because I get images from architects and so forth. And the, for instance, Bernard Schumi's images of Parc de la Villette also, you know, published very, very widely over many years, nevertheless were tightly controlled by, but by his office. But I don't know, uh, that's, that's not what you're saying. You're saying that there's actually, and they, I mean the brand, it did become a brand obviously. It became a very specific kind of brand for event structures, but also a brand for Paris and also a brand. But he, he was very careful, he controlled very tightly the, the dispersal of those, of those images. Um, But you're saying architecture has, I'm sorry, where does the architecture piece come in? Just uh, tell me, the, you, the sa you said itself. it already. The, the building itself, so the the building itself it which doesn't, it's not it's only doesn't it's belong to itself, but it also, branding is another way in which it's captured by property, by the, by, a, by property system, is that what you're saying, that, or? That, that it is simultaneously real property and intellectual property. Yes, okay, so right, 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 yeah, yeah, okay, that's absolutely right, I see, yeah, yeah, no, that's great. That's great, actually. That's a good. That's an excellent example. <laughs> it is. That's really good. Do you have anyone else? Uh, I was just going to bring up the issue with uh, maybe actually Park de La Ville would be a good example of that confluence in architecture. Yeah. Um, this this intellectual property, architecture property issue comes up uh, currently with the Obama posters. Um, the the artist who made those posters is in a big battle with um, the photographer who actually took the poster. And it brings up this issue of the, the medium changing the intellectual property. Uh, does it have an effect on it? Um, and if I was going to ask you if you see a connection there of does architecture, by becoming concrete, does it actually change the intellectual property that is involved in the project? Uh, um, you know, I, I was working on intellectual property law before I became concerned with real property law. And, uh, it, and so I don't, in, in a way, I don't know the ins and outs of intellectual property law at this moment. But uh, the, I, the, the, the context, I mean, the context of intellectual property law is crucial, right? because the context can be, I mean, even the context can be owned by somebody else, so that you have no right to just, I mean, when you uh, publish a book, for example, you don't own the book. The book is owned by the publishing company. And so the, even though you have rights to republish that material because you're the author, you don't, uh, you don't have the right, you know, the book, the actual book is owned by the publishing company. And so you could say they could it could be contextualized as it has as it has been in a number of instances it could be context recontextualized by the publishing company in such a way that you would you know uh, that you would not there would be an instance that you wouldn't be asked to agree to or you wouldn't be participating in that it would be running ahead completely without you and so there's all sorts of all sorts of ways in which you can repackage intellectual property and in, in, in order to own it, you know, uh, to own it anew in a different context. So that's the, that's the slipperiness of intellectual property. The, the difference from, you know, that's why it's partly because it, 
it is, it exists in, uh, I mean, it's no different than real property in the sense that it's a series of relations, but it's, uh, but it, it's, uh, you know, it uh, exists in the realm of language, and language is able to restructure it as needed, and legal language in particular is able to restructure it, you know, as something that doesn't, you know, where the author is no longer in, in control of it or where the architect is no longer uh, the one that, even though the architect did the sketches, the sketches have now passed into another frame of reference that allows them to be republished uh, without the architect's name even, you know, like as an advertisement or something. Without even those rights having been sold. I think this is also happening, I mean, this happens to some degree in music as well, but uh, uh, because music is so, e travels so easily, right? I mean, it's, um, uh, that it, you, all you have to do is just, you know, you can copy it. And so it just travels very, it's very cheap and easy to get it. Uh, and so, uh, so it's hard to track it. It's hard to bound it. Um, and I think that's, that's what's going on. In, in, all, the, all the advances in intellectual property now are being made in the on internet cases, I think. Because that's where this question of the real property and intellectual property are coming to a kind of head that, you know, uh, with virtual property that's being sold. Incredible talk. That, uh I think really is quite radical in, in the way you're thinking of uh, defining and pursuing what we mean by architecture by separating it or beginning to make distinctions between uh, architecture proper and building as property, um, at least if I'm understanding it. And so, you know, it, it, again, just to set up the question I want to ask a little bit. Um, it seems to me that you're essentially saying a, a profound theoretical question for architecture isn't where does it come from or how do we recognize it, but who owns it um, and how do we know and by what mechanisms, you know, and, and that that might be uh, at this moment in time a great way to ask very profound questions about uh, of architectural theory. And I, one thing that really struck me and I, what I wanted to ask you about in regard to that is uh, a different relationship between architecture and landscape now, uh, especially within the, the framework of sustainability discourse. You know, there's a way in which landscape has sort of trumped architecture as, right. you know, the, the discipline that uh, can engage that, um, the, the, the real potential of sustainability as a, a way to change the way we think of public space, the way we think of economics, the convergence of artificial systems and natural systems, you know, all, all that stuff that you're talking about. And I, and I was thinking of, uh, at, at some moment, uh, you know, Emerson's famous comment, a, a question about who owns the landscape. Um, you know, and, and so Emerson is a sort of anti-Jeffersonian or non-Jeffersonian thinker. Um, so all of that as a kind of mix, I, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, either architecture and sustainability or this relationship between architecture and landscape now? Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, um, I mean, the, um, certainly the, I mean, I was, I, I was interested at one point in, um, I was thinking that computational work would lead us naturally to a mechanism that could grasp the issues of sustainability. I thought it would just be a natural evolution because it, you can model vast landscapes, you can monitor individual, you know, individual, highly individual and complex, you know, sort of uh, locales and at the same time uh, massive amounts of information and um, local, global, et cetera. Also, structurally, there were structures that you could, you know, lay, layer information into and, uh, and then lay them over and grasp the ecological consequences of that and so forth. So, I, I, so I, I, I've been interested in how computation has gone in and out of in a certain kind of sustainability questions. 
off, I mean, I'm, I'm taking landscape now as kind of surface, treatments of surface that are uh, expansive and smart and flexible and plastic and also capable of carrying information and resource and all these other things that we're kind of packing in, at least ideologically, into the, the skins that we dream of, you know. As skin as erasing the difference, the hard difference between the building and the landscape. Uh, and it occurred to me that really uh, that um, the problem, I, I'm not sure exactly how, I mean, it's something I want to look more closely at. The people that have been doing it effectively, I think, are running into um, a lot of problems. I mean, there's running into the problem of the difference between the landscape and the ecology, for example. The landscape is already given as a sort of um, productive unit or as a, a system of property or as a system of bounded or calculable dimensions already given as a source of mineral wealth or, or uh, you know, agricultural wealth already tied economically to almost all the possible ways of slicing and dicing it have been thought of in the interest of um, exploitation of resources. And so to actually get into that and then pass through it to the larger expansiveness of the influences on any piece of land, let's say, or any city or any conglomerate or any settlement or anything, the massive uh, amount of information and influences from extensive and interrelated systems of life and you know uh, ecological systems is uh, is uh, it seems actually inhibited by you know by uh, that uh, by sort of um, landscapes that can't expand or that become rigid uh, and and computational projects that <coughs> end up sort of facing their, the, the truth that they can't be realized unless they find a property system to contain them. You know, that you can't have a, a building sitting on an ecological plinth that doesn't, I mean, we've tried things like that, but it's not, it's not, it's, 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 it creates a tremendous predicament for architecture. So I'm not saying, I, I always tend to get too opposition, you know, too set up on the hard and the, the soft or the rigid and, and the static and the dynamic, but I, I actually think those categories are hard, are not necessarily categories that we're, you know, working in. I think we're work, trying to work in all sorts of different ways toward this issue. But um, I think property is getting in the way in a major way. <laughs> I mean, that relationship with property, architecture's relationship with property. We don't have a way of thinking through the ideal and the contingent that is not always already a property condition. And that's, so we're, you know, that's why it's classic to say, but that's why we were hired by the kings, you know, to like build the, build the, build the, the palaces of, that then would, where, where all the landowners lived. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it was, it was, it makes sense in a way, because we know, we know how to do that. But um, to do something else, I'm not sure. It's a great question, though. Great question. Landscape is really fascinating. Okay. Urbaniz urbanism. I think we'll take one more question. No. And I also don't want to vilify property. <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask if I'm misreading a conclusion I'm drawing from the two gaps you set up, which seem to form an analogy. The one gap you mentioned, the well-known Jeffersonian shift from pursuit of property to pursuit of happiness, but you didn't, you didn't deconstruct the, the difficulty with what happiness becomes as sort of the right. some excess that can't be nailed down. And right. the other gap you introduce is architecture is that which is designed, which is in a sense not able to be defined by property. And along there, and you're mentioning of the sort of visual, the construction of the subject, there was, and, and the sort of properties, the relation of use established at a place, there was the sense of that which is propitious or that which is an impropriety. And the analogy seems to therefore play out. Architecture is the liberal pursuit of impropriety that cannot be propertied. Um, and in a sense, that is that an almost important distinction to, to be able to roll out of this. You, without property, you can't pursue architecture as that which is impropriety which is sort of necessarily an excess outside of any normative system. Interesting you say impropriety because, I mean, I think I know what you mean. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, um, 
um, this part is is something that's just recently come up and is the split between propriety and property. In other words, one, even though property was formulated around proprieties, customs, uh, and then now custom, which is routines of everyday life, let's say, uh, or ways of behaving as citizens that allow us to negotiate differences in the face of property differences or property inequities or whatever. Those proprieties are being split from property and property just becomes its own like voracious kind of expansive thing. But that's, that's a political question. But in the, in the architectural mode, architecture is like um, that housing of propriety in a way, housing of proprieties. In other words, that's what we are talking about when we're talking about a living room. We're talking about a certain kind of social engagement that, you know, where you're, you're sitting down. You're not, we aren't talking about the fights that happen in houses, you know, even though those are part of the propriety territory as well. Um, but normally we're trying to address the proprieties of living and um, of, or of life in various sorts of institutional settings, whatever it is. And so that um, question of propriety and architecture's um, husbanding of the proprieties of life, uh, which it does in the most benevolent uh, and bogus way to some degree, you know, you could say a certain kind of, of benevolence that architecture has toward its subject is mixed. It's like a good thing and it's not, and there are other parts of it that aren't so good. I mean, parts of it are heavy handed, parts of it are kind of like, um, okay, let's keep it all at a distance and all sorts of other things. But um, so um, I'm just beginning to sort of think of that propriety as actually belonging to a radically different political model that architecture actually s might still be participating in, I mean, I don't know whether it's an anthropological model of settlement, you know, that we're still operating in res with respect to, or whether we're, or kinship cultures, which I have just begun to study in a different way, not in an anthropological way, but more in a uh, linguistic way. Um, so, um, so I'm not sure, I'm, therefore the word impropriety caught me a little off guard because I'm not sure why, what, how, you said that architecture. Well, in a way, if sustainability yeah. is like the careful husbanding of propriety and is therefore almost the banalizing of design, isn't it, it almost sets up architecture as the pursuit of happiness vis-a-vis -vis that which is the most impropitious, yeah. like the pursuit of impropriety. Yeah. Yeah, seems I see. to come out of That's the analogy you set yeah. up, but I didn't yeah. know if that was your yeah, intention. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah, I have to. I'll definitely take account of that. The the pursuit of happiness, though, I want to just say one more word on with respect to that because uh, pursuit of happiness. You know, there's a lot of a, a lot of people have been perplexed by the word happiness. Obviously, they talk about the Greeks or the you know the Greek idea of happiness, which is civic virtue. Um, in other words. Pursuit of happiness means you're going to pursue the, you're going to pursue a civic setting that allows you to solve problems as a community as a community of different people, and so uh, the pursuit of happiness in Jeffersonian. This is the class. This is the theory of Jefferson's idea here, even though who knows what he was thinking. But uh, it was uh, it was to uh, make sure that it wasn't just uh, mercantilism, that it wasn't just uh, to make because mercantilism was on you know a huge part of this and also alienability of property was what constituted the United States it was it was the land was immediately changed from British uh, property law which held land for centuries in land tenure through generations of families you know in primogenitor but also you just it immediately abolished all of that and said no every single piece of property in this country is for sale. And it's a huge country and we're gonna sell it all. You know, we're gonna sell it all and that's gonna be the source of the wealth of the country. And so it was Im immediately completely alienable, the entire land, even though none of it belonged to the, you know, to the early settlers, it belonged to the Native Americans who didn't have a theory of private property. So of course we know that whole conjunction. But um, so the pursuit of, so Jefferson, who was a, you know, fairly fair-minded, and also the person to whom all the roads lead at a certain moment, you know, wildly, the thinker to whom all the roads lead, uh, was interested in not just uh, acceding openly to a kind of land grab uh, 
as a basis for a nation and so as a kind of sovereign body that was you know organized around the alienability of land so I think happiness stands in for property but it stands in in a more complex way than one might imagine um, yeah I'm, I'm just going to um, continue on the um, uh, sustainability, but go back to what you said at the beginning, um, which is just that, you know, the growth as the productive um, engine of, of capitalism, and then that architecture is an apparatus. So is it, do you think it's possible for architecture to slow down growth as, I mean, its essence is to grow and to, and to add value? Is it possible for it to act as an agent of slowing down growth and in that way um, create that's conditions for, for... That's an for interesting for thought. For, for sustainability. Yeah, that's an interesting thought, that it could actually act as kind of an inhibitor. I mean, I guess maybe it does that sometimes, just willy-nilly, right? I mean, it, it slows it down because it can't itself be... I mean, there because it loads, it loads the site in a certain sense. It can load up, it can load the site with... Uh, certain kind of uh, in inhibitions to change, that's both good and bad, right? But it, uh, yeah, that's interesting. The thing is that property value uh, is, a few, is an engine for, for urban, urbanization, obviously. And um, so uh, if architecture increases property value under certain, it doesn't always increase it, but let's say it increases it generally architecture increases property, property value and also is uh, responsible for you know, class organization, all sorts of other things, gentrification. Um, that it also, through the same mechanism of infusing property with uh, symbolic value, could uh, use that symbolic value to um, reinstitute a set of uh, s slower moving proprieties rather than a propriety-based kind of system as opposed to a property-based system, something like that. That could be interesting. So it's like, like an intensify, intensification of uh, life and, or something like that would inhibit uh, just the spilling of the city from property to property or property value to property value. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank, thank you.